Um, so I am Jerry Bonavia, and I have been working on this issue for about 24 years. So it's been a long time. Um, it feels like the conversations sometimes haven't changed a lot, um, but but they are starting to change. I think more and more. So today, what I, or tonight, what I'm hoping to cover with you is a little bit about the scope of gun violence. How big is this problem? What does it look like? And then maybe talk a little bit about how we can um, use facts and uh, solid information in our conversations. And what we'll be up against is kind of some half-truths and slogans, and, and how can we get beyond that? And especially, how can we find common ground? Because most own gun owners um, in our state and in our country agree with us that we need to do more to prevent gun violence. So let's get started, Heidi with a very large number. So this number is the number of U.S. service men and women who have been killed in battle from the beginning of our country until now. So the American Revolution, the War of 1812, the Indian Wars, the Mexican-American War, the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the Gulf Wars, the War on Terror, and all other wars and conflicts. Almost this exact same number of men, women, and children have been killed here at home with guns in 20 years. Okay. So in one year, the most recent year for which we have data, more than 38,000 American men, women, and children were killed with guns. And I think what sometimes can surprise people is that the um, number of suicides with firearms makes up about 60% of all of the gun deaths. That's really important for us to know because when we're talking about solutions to gun violence, we might need to use different strategies to prevent gun suicides than we do to prevent gun homicides. Here in Wisconsin in 2015, again the most recent year for which we have data, more than 600 men, women, and children were killed with guns. And in Wisconsin about 75 to 80 percent of our gun deaths are gun suicides. Hold up for a second. So um, beyond the gun deaths, um, it, which make up just kind of a, the tip of the iceberg, another 100,000 people are injured with guns. And frequently the injuries associated with gun violence are devastating, life-altering, catastrophic injuries. So I'm going to put up a slide for just a second. Look away if you'd like. Um, and go on. So beyond those who are struck by bullets, we know that gun violence has an impact on their friends, their neighbors, their families, really all of us. Beyond the human toll of gun violence, we know that the direct and indirect economic toll is enormous, about $229 billion every year. Go ahead. So clearly this is a problem that we need to address now and especially for our future. Um, and you would think, given the toll that it's taken on our country, that we would be addressing it by all means, <coughs> aggressively. Um, and, and perhaps what's most frustrating to me is that we know how to prevent gun violence. We have strong evidence and research and data that would lead us in the right direction to at least prevent some of the gun injuries and deaths that we have in this country. But our facts, our data, don't exist in a <coughs> vacuum, right? So what they are up against and what the national conversation and our state conversation has been um, driven by is really a lot of the bumper sticker, sticker slogans and the talking points and the messages that come from the gun lobby. And one good thing that's come from this current administration is we now have a term for that. 
So if we look at their messaging, what they talk about, we can kind of put their messages into three or four broad categories. And one of those categories is you can own guns, right? So they're just trying to break through any um, hesitation that people might have. And, and they make sure that you understand that guns aren't the problem. They're safe, you'll be safe, right? And so we'll look at some of those messages. And then there's another broad category of messages that, that says not only can you own a gun, but you should own a gun. You'll be safer. Your family will be safer if you own a gun. Your community will be safer. And then the final group of their messages are kind of clustered around this idea that, and we will do whatever it takes to make sure that you and everyone else can own guns. So the first uh, area, the you can own guns area, starts with a whole bunch of slogans that you'll probably recognize, like, guns don't kill people. People. That's right. <laughs> and it turns out it's true for Zarbonians as well. So um, if we're looking at, at this, um, some of the other slogans that we hear that kind of go with this, that guns just are not the problem, right? We have some other example, guns are just tools. Have you guys heard that one? It's just they're no different than a hammer or a shovel. Another one. And if bad guys, and then we could put in parentheses here, who we help arm, if the bad guys don't use guns, they'll just use something else. But it turns out that life is quite different than the game of Clue, where there's no difference between Miss Scarlet with a candlestick and Colonel Mustard with a revolver. So what we know is that most of the homicides committed in our country are committed with firearms, right? So if we look from 2006 to 2016, it's pretty consistent. Anywhere between 66 to 73% of our homicides are committed with firearms. And they really are quite different. They're not the same as other instruments that are used. So I know this might be a little bit hard to see, but basically all of these areas that are highlighted they're all different types of firearms. So if you added those all together, that top line would go out even further. And we see that guns make up a disproportionate uh, amount of the um, uh, implements that are used in murders, especially relative to all other types like knives or blunt instruments. The other thing that the gun lobby uh, specifies, if we go back to Guns don't kill people, people kill people. They have very specific people in mind when they're talking about that. And if you listen to some of the NRA's um, speeches to Wayne LaPierre, the executive vice president, he will talk about the Mexican drug cartels. He'll talk about the gang bangers in the inner city. He'll talk about the Black Lives Matter thugs. And he's just added recently the violent leftists. Mm -hmm. So again, they're going back to this idea that as long as you aren't black or brown or liberal, you can have a gun and you'll be fine, right? But they pick out one other category of people to single out, and that's people with mental illnesses. And they s specifically say, you know, we want to keep guns out of the hands of lunatics, right? So this is from Ammo Land, and this is exactly the kind of messaging that we see frequently, that guns aren't the problem, it's these particular people. I'm gonna switch to the next one. It's a long quote, we can just read part of it. The truth is that our society is populated by an unknown number of genuine monsters, people so deranged, so evil, so possessed by voices, and driven by demons that no sane person can possibly ever comprehend them. Okay, so they want to draw a distinction here. Go. And like lots of their messages, it feels like, well, maybe there's a kernel of truth to this. I, I don't know. But in particular, this one rings true with 
far too many of our fellow citizens. 46% of Americans believe that persons with serious mental illness are far more dangerous than the general population. But if you look at the data, you will know that people with mental illness are far more likely to be victims than perpetrators. In fact, if we look at serious mental illness, we know that it contributes about 4% of all of the violence, right? So even if we were able to stop people who have mental illness from committing any acts of violence, we would still have 96% of our violence, right? It is important, however, to understand, especially when we're talking about who should and who shouldn't have access to firearms easily, that there is a stronger connection to people who um, are interested in doing self-harm in suicide. So we can go on. So again, whether or not someone has a mental illness is not a good predictor of whether they are going to be violent. Other factors are far more important and they include being young and male, having a history of alcohol or drug abuse, or having a history of violence. Go ahead. And again, there is this connection between mental illness, especially um, severe depression, um, and uh, use of a firearm to commit suicide. So that's something that we do want to keep in mind, especially as we're looking at solutions. <coughs> okay, so we're going to switch to the next category here. So you can have a gun, right? But it's important from the gun lobby's point of view that you know you should have a gun. And we've all heard this one, right? The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. They want us to believe that guns are the solution, right? And they, they create this, this strong motivation to have a gun by convincing us that the world is a terrible and dangerous place. So this is very long. I'm just going to read a little piece of this. And I should stop and just mention, by the way, if anyone wants a copy of the slides, just let me know, and I'm happy to email them out to you. So this, again, is from Wayne LaPierre, the executive vice president of the NRA. And he says, in this uncertain world, surrounded by lies and corruption everywhere you look, there is no greater freedom than the right to survive and protect our families with all the rifles shotguns and handguns we want. We know in the world that surrounds us there are terrorists and there are home invaders, drug cartels, carjackers, knockout gamers and rapers, and haters and campus killers, airport killers, shopping mall killers, and killers who scheme to destroy our country with massive storm of violence. If that rings a bell to you, if that sounds an awful lot like the speech we heard a year ago from the president, it's because the person who had a strong hand in writing the American Carnage, which is what that speech was called, um, is a huge fan of Wayne LaPierre. So we can check this out, right? We can, we can test this theory. If guns are the solution, then in the United States, we should be the safest country by far. Because if you look at gun ownership rates among all of the industrialized countries, what we see is that over here, this is the United States. These are all the other countries. We've got Switzerland, Finland, Sweden, Norway, France, Canada, Australia. Austria. As of the time of the, that this chart was created, we had 88 guns for every 100 people in the country. There's actually new data for the United States, but I don't have data for all of the other countries, so I didn't use that chart. But the new da data for the United States is that there are 112 guns for every 100 people. We have more guns in civilian hands than we do people. So are we the safest? country? No, not even close. So that great big bar across the top, that's the United States. That's our homicide rates. Compare us to all of these other countries. And we can go into more detail on this. Um, if you look at the United States compared with 22 other high-income 
low-income countries combined, what we find is that our total homicide rate is seven times higher. And that is driven almost completely by our firearm homicide rate, which is 25 times higher. For our young pe people, the 15 to 24 year olds, it's even more dire, 49 times higher. Similarly, our firearm suicide rate is higher. Said another way, 82% of all of the deaths that occurred in those countries, those 23 countries, all of the firearm deaths happened here in the US. For women, 90%, and for our youngest children, 91%. So we can see that similar kind of um, difference if we look here at home at the states. And what this is showing is the number of gun deaths per 100,000 people <coughs> and the percentage of households that have firearms. And although there are, is some deviation off of the trend line, what we are seeing is uh, a correlation um, a strong positive effect. So the higher the household gun ownership, the more likely that that state experiences more firearm is deaths. Is Missouri before or after they make the change? Is what? Missouri on there. Is that before they loosen their gun ownership laws or, or when they were tighter? Well, this is, this is probably after. A okay. Because mm -hmm. that, that alone makes it dramatic. Charles. It does, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about okay. Missouri in, in a minute. <clears throat> okay, so even though we see this kind of relationship, it doesn't prevent the gun lobby and the politicians who, um, who follow them from continuing to put out that message that we're safer in our homes and we're safer in public with, uh, with guns. So we see people like former Sheriff Clark um, who took out PSAs to tell people that they should consider having a gun to protect themselves. And what was truly offensive about that in my mind was that he made this, you know, uh, encouraged people to get guns. And what he never mentioned is that, and you should also consider the risk factors for you, you and for your family, right? And if we can go on. Because what we know about having a gun in the home is that just the fact that you have a gun in your house puts you and your family at higher risk for both homicide and suicide, right? We do know that that risk is not distributed equally. So we understand that there are risk factors that, that make it more likely, and the absence of those risk factors decreases the overall risk for your family. But it's worth knowing about that, right? And so some of those risk factors are, do you or anyone in your home have a history of alcohol or drug abuse? Is there a history of serious depression or other types of mental illness that may increase the chance of suicide? And in particular, is there a history of violence? So the gun lobby tells you that you need a gun so that you can um, you know, uh, defend yourself against intruders. But a study looked at that and found that it's 22 times more likely that that gun will be used against you or your family um, rather than in a self-defense shooting. Uh, you know, I've heard that for some time. Uh, has this been researched again and, and re-verified? There have been a number of studies done um, about uh, the risks associated yeah, with... Yeah, 22 times thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, there had been one that was done earlier that was measuring something a little bit different, so the numbers are different. Yeah. But this is thought to be pretty solid yeah, research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, OK, we can go on. So in particular, the gun lobby talks about the benefits for women to have guns. And 
I have to tell you, because I've been doing this a really long time, right, that they have been saying this for decades. They've been saying that women, you need to, you need to have guns. It's too dangerous out there without them. And women have consistently responded with, meh. So <laughs> the gun ownership rates among women have not changed in decades. So as much as they would like us to believe that our danger comes from strangers, if you look at this top chart, you'll see that actually a relative small number of women are killed by strangers. Far more are killed by people they know, or in particular, by their spouses or partners. And similarly, what we know is that having a gun in a home, if there's domestic violence, um, puts women at much greater risk. So if you're comparing two households, both of them sadly have a history of domestic violence. If there's a gun in one of those homes, the women, woman is five times more likely to be killed than in a home where there is domestic violence but no gun. So what about in public places? We hear a couple of these slogans on a regular basis, more guns, less crime, and an armed society is a polite society. So back in 2011, Wisconsin, the Wisconsin legislature decided to legalize the carrying of concealed weapons in public places. It was a campaign that the gun lobby had been doing all across the country. Um, they started in Florida in 1987, um, got to Wisconsin in 2011. We were the second to the last state to actually legalize it. And the proponents of that law, um, as, as it was being debated, promised us that we would be safer if more people were carrying more guns in more places. And their argument was that the bad guys won't know who's carrying a gun, so they won't touch anyone. It'll be the angel effect, is what they called it. So nobody will be at risk because the bad guys won't know which one of us are carrying a gun, and so they won't, they won't do anything. So let's take a look at whether their promises held up. So we can look at a couple of different measurements. This one is the aggravated assaults with a gun. And if we look from 20 th 28 to 2015, what we see is there was kind of a trend going down. It reversed in 2011. This is just an observation. We can't prove causation with this. We're just noting what happened in those years. Go ahead. Similarly, we can look at what happened with the murder rate, which went up in Milwaukee by 69%, went up in communities outside of Milwaukee by 84%. We also see that the incidence of violent crime went from 236 per 100,000 to 305 per 100,000. Um, so again, this is not some robust study that attempted to um, tease out whether it was the effect of the law. However, studies have been done around the country since the first uh, concealed carry laws were passed. And they've attempted to answer that question. And they continue to show very strong correlation between passage of the law and increase in, in crime. Last week, a study came out. It's actually a working paper. Um, but it came from John Donahue at Stanford and his colleagues. And he's been looking at this question for about 20 years. Most recently, he's added 14 years of data where a number of states changed their law, and he's using a far more sophisticated st statistical analysis. And for the first time, a researcher has come out and said there is a causal relationship, that you p if you pass these right-to-carry laws, you can anticipate an increase in violent crime. So if this is true, if, if what these laws do is actually put people in greater danger, and if having guns in your home actually puts you in greater danger, then we need to ask ourselves, why is the gun lobby continuing to push these uh, looser gun laws? Do I have any guesses? Money. Money. Yeah. I knew I'd get the right answer here. Yeah. 
Um, so I want to show you another effect of the concealed carry law. So what this is, is a, a look at the number of handguns that are purchased in Wisconsin across a number of years. We, can, we can't see all of the handguns that are purchased. Um, some of that data just is not publicly available. It's not gathered. But we can see the number of handguns purchased from licensed gun dealers. So if there are any trends, we should be able to pick them up, even though we're not seeing private sales in this case. So what we know is that in 2004, 2005, and on and on, Wisconsin sold about, or licensed gun dealers in Wisconsin sold about 3,000, 3,500 handguns a month, or about 40,000 handguns a year. What we see here in 2008, 2009, is what around the country is called the Obama bump. Mm -hmm. And so there was a you know, great sense of urgency. There was a lot of panic. There was a lot of um, distressful emails being sent out and cards saying, he's going to take your guns. And so a lot of people went out and, and bought guns. But look at this step and this step. So in 2011, uh, the state legislature passed the concealed carry law. It was signed in July. It did not go into effect until November. But beginning in summer of 2011, we started seeing handgun sales going from about 3,000 or 4,000 per month to about 8,000 per month, right? In 2012, the first full year, of the concealed carry law being in, in effect, we went up to 160,000 handguns from 40,000. 160,000 handguns per year in our state. So that's quite, um, that's quite a benefit, a boost to the gun industry. They're pleased with this. And in, on top of the guns that they sell, there's all the accessories. And those accessories come with much bigger profit margins, right? So the holsters and the concealed carry garments and the concealed carry purses and they have concealed carry bras. I mean, anything. <laughs> um, that's okay. We can go on. They had a fashion show last year. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> that's exactly right. In August. Um, so just to kind of close the loop on this notion of uh, guns. Uh, making us all safer. Just want to tell the story. This is Melanie Hahn. Um, she was a, a really vocal advocate for carrying guns in public places. She ended up going uh, to court to, you know, get her right to carry her her weapon at her daughter's soccer games. Um, she was kind of in the news all the time and, and really outspoken on this issue. Melanie Hahn was shot and killed by her husband at home, and her gun was hanging on a hook within arm's reach. So the, the last category of, of um, uh, messaging that the gun lobby goes through is, you know, we will do anything to make sure that you and everyone else can, can buy a gun. And one thing that they do is they make the case that gun laws don't work, right? And I don't know if you guys have ever talked to or tried to debate with someone online about guns. They always get to a point where they're like, Chicago, but Chicago. Um, and, and what I figured out is that those exclamation points, because there's always exclamation points, right? It's, it's actually like vertical Morse code for, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what they claim is that Chicago is the murder capital of the world and it has the strictest gun laws anywhere. So both of those things are false. Um, Chicago does have the highest number of people murdered um, in the United States, but it does not have the strictest gun laws anywhere. So going into a little bit more detail about the number. When we talk about raw numbers, we have to be really careful because Chicago is an enormous city. It has lots and lots of people. 
And so we're not really measuring risk when we talk about raw numbers. And the better way to talk about this is to compare rates, right? So that we're actually measuring what an individual's risk is in one place versus another place. And so what researchers do is they measure the number of people killed per 100,000. And that's a, that's a way that we can kind of compare apples with apples. So let's look at Chicago when we look at rates. So I will point out that Chicago is there toward the bottom. And it is, you know, um, much higher rates in, in all of these other cities. I'll point out that Milwaukee is right here above Chicago. We kind of tend to um, jockey places with them pretty much uh, from year to year. Why are New York City and Los Angeles Because their rates of gun violence are much, much lower. Uh, like a footnote, lower than Tulsa? Yes, much. Because they have stronger laws. Correct. So why don't we put that on there? <laughs> well, okay, so I have to admit I didn't make this. <laughs> um, but you're absolutely right that um, even though the number of people killed in New York is probably higher than Tulsa, uh, in fact, I'm sure it is, the rate is much lower. So for any one individual living or visiting New York, the risk is actually lower there than it is in any of these uh, cities. So another. Um, oh, Jerry, before you get away from that, yeah. I want to make a point. You know, the other factor too is that no matter how strong your laws are, there's no wall around Chicago, so guns can come in from the outside. Now, one place that does have kind of a wall around it is the state of Hawaii. Correct. It's an ocean. Correct. And they have some fairly strict gun laws, and they have low rate. I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand they have low rates of homicide. Very low, and so it's actually an interesting point because Alaska and Hawaii serve as kind of good uh, testing grounds because they aren't as affected by their um, surround surroundings, and so Alaska has a really high uh, gun ownership rate. They have a really high gun fatality rate. That includes suicides as well as suicide. absolutely, yeah. absolutely, and well, and in like in Alaska, it's primarily and suicides. Even though Indiana is so close yeah, by Chicago, where there are lots of gun shows and oh, lots okay. of open buying and selling guns, it's still that low in Chicago, and it's very easy to buy a gun in Indiana. Correct. So most of uh, the crime guns that end up in Chicago come from Indiana. Um, and then Louisiana, and then Wisconsin. Here in Wisconsin, most of our c crime guns come from Wisconsin, because <laughs> you don't have to go anywhere else. You, you can get them here. So another um, uh, um, argument that's made by the gun lobby is that we don't need more laws. We need to enforce the existing laws. So this supposes that we actually have a lot of gun laws, um, which I'm going to go through a couple really important ones that we don't have. But it, uh, it's also making the case that we can't do two things at one time, that we couldn't have stronger gun laws and enforce them, which seems like kind of a common sense approach. So I just want to kind of look for very briefly at a couple of the laws that we don't have here. One is a lethal violence protective order, especially in a state like I, ours where 75 to 80% of the gun deaths are suicides. This is a means of perhaps helping to prevent some of those suicides. So what it does is it gives families in particular and law enforcement officers um, the means to petition a judge to temporarily remove the firearms from people who are in imminent danger of hurting themselves and others. Um, so if we look, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, and again, you can have these slides if you want them. Um, in a study that looked at and evaluated this law in Connecticut, what they found was first that most of those risk warrants were being used for people who were a danger to themselves. So that, that kind of helps us understand that this, this really would be helpful uh, to prevent suicide. And the other thing that it found is that it worked. 
that for every 10 to 11 guns that were removed based on this risk, um, one life was saved. Go ahead. Another law that we don't have is a requirement for background checks on all gun sales. So I'll try to go through this really briefly, but basically when it comes to gun sales, there are two separate um, types of commerce. So on the one hand, we have regulated, somewhat regulated gun sales. Um, if you buy a gun from a licensed gun dealer, you need to show identification, you need to have a background check, and the dealer maintains a record of the sale. If, however, you buy a gun from a private seller or unlicensed seller, um, then you don't need to show identification. They can't do a background check and they don't need to maintain the paperwork. So those sales are completely anonymous, right? If you were a bad guy with a criminal record who couldn't get a gun th going through the regulated part of gun commerce, you can simply move over and go to the unregulated part. Those unregulated sales um, include any kind of gun, just about, not fully auto guns, but you can get an assault pistol, an assault rifle. You can get assault pistols with large capacity magazines. You can buy a 50 caliber BMG, which the manufacturer of this gun claims you can take down a helicopter from a mile away. And these gun sales occur anywhere. So they can happen at gun shows, they can happen at a garage sale, they can happen out of the trunk of a car, in an alleyway, and they can happen online. So there's uh, uh, several websites, one of them is called Arms List. And if you go to Arms List, you can specify in a drop down menu that you just want to look at guns that are for sale from private parties. So guns that don't require a background check. Um, this one's for sale in West, was for sale, it's old, um, in West Dallas, and it's an assault pistol, no background check. Um, so we have these two different types of commerce, right? One if you go to a licensed gun dealer, one if you go to an unlicensed seller. What makes the difference between those two? It's not the number of guns being sold. It's, it's not whether or not you have a, a brick and mortar store. It's really kind of gray area. So this person is a private party seller, and yet all these guns are on display shelves and they're all marked with tags. But he's not in the business, and therefore the guns he sells doesn't need to do background check doesn't need to check identification. So you can, you can go to arms list to put guns up for sale. You can go there and list yourself as a buyer too. And you can say, I want to buy guns, but I want to buy them just from a private party. And I thought this one was kind of clever because he's saying he has cash and then he took a picture of his cash <laughs> just to prove the point. <coughs> So I'm a, I apologize for the blurriness of this. I just wrote it down here. Um, this is a private party, a buyer looking for a gun. He, is, um, he was from Brown Deer, from a few blocks away from here. And the interesting thing about his message is how many times he says he wants the gun right now, ASCP. He needs a, a larger handgun. He needs a high capacity magazine. He needs it now. Well, a seller saw this and contacted him. And they met at a McDonald's parking lot in Germantown. He bought the gun on a Saturday morning. On Sunday morning, he went to a Zana Spa shot and killed his estranged wife and her co-workers. What we know from research is that background checks work, that they are the single most effective way, single most effective law um, to prevent gun violence. So some studies have been done, and um, what they found is that after Connecticut passed its permit to purchase law, which included a requirement for background checks, firearm homicide rate decreased by 40%. Um, on the other hand, Missouri had a permit to purchase requirement, including background checks. They eliminated, they repealed their law, 
And after repealing their law, what they found, um, they experienced a 25% increase in the firearm homicide rate. Do you have the same chart for uh, Australia? Because I know the statistics are out there. Yeah, um, I don't. Australia, Australia did something different. Um, they took everybody's guns away. Well, <laughs> they they um, made it much more difficult to own uh, certain types of guns sure. a after the mass shooting. And what they experienced was a little bit different than this, but they experienced no mass shootings after they uh, after they made that move. Plus, it's political suicide. Uh, in Australia to run uh, on, a, on a repeal of uh, that law. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so not only do background checks work really well, but it turns out that they're incredibly popular. So what we know is that background checks in Wisconsin are more popular than beer or cheese or Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> Rogers. And I will specify that that was in a year that he played the entire season and did quite well. Um, so the other thing that we hear is um, that new gun laws aren't a serious solution because criminals don't obey the law. I'm going to go really quickly through this. I apologize, but we're getting a little bit behind here. So, yeah. So how do we reinstate the background checks in Wisconsin? Well, we do require background checks, as does every state. Um, for gun sales through licensed gun dealers. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm thinking the waiting period. Sorry. So, I'm thinking sideways. Okay, so the, right, so we, we used to have a waiting period for mm -hmm. those gun sales that went through a licensed gun dealer. Right. They yeah. repealed no, I'm that. I'm thinking sideways, sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, it would be a very good thing, though, to bring back the waiting <laughs> period. Um, so, so the gun lobby makes the case that criminals don't obey law. We, we know that having a law to keep, the gun, to keep guns out of the hands of people who are prohibited actually does work. Um, and that's why we see that in the regulated part of the market, it's harder for felons, for example, to get guns. But because we leave open um, this amazing loophole, they have a means of, of acquiring guns. The other thing that we do is we don't prohibit other high-risk people from getting guns. We know that people who have a history of violence that does not rise to the level of felony are also at higher <coughs> risk of uh, committing bad acts with, with guns. This is really kind of in the weeds stuff, but the important thing is noting that if a person had any prior history of, uh, of conviction, that 50% of those people went on to get arrested for any type of crime. And, and I should also specify that this study was done in California measuring whether or not their law to prevent violent misdemeanors from purchasing guns was effective. And so the study is limited in a couple of ways. It's one state. Um, the ages they looked at were only 18 to 35. The authors feel confident that this would apply across the board. Go ahead. And I think we're just going to skip through these. Let's skip through another. So the gun lobby, instead of working for laws that we know would be effective in helping to prevent gun violence, they're trying to push the other direction and make sure that even more people can have more guns in more places. This year they tried to, or are still trying to, change our law so that people can carry concealed weapons without meeting the current requirements, which is a very low grade training and a background check. That same law, that same bill rather, um, would also repeal the ban on guns in K through 12 schools and other sensitive areas. <clears throat> What's even more popular than background checks is maintaining the requirement for training and permits. So the reason I'm showing these is so that we understand that, you know, when you hit 91%, when you hit 85%, you're talking about in a state where we don't agree on much of anything, right? We're talking about agreement kind of across the board. 
Um, and, and this is among gun owners and non-gun owners alike. So if we can start our conversations or continue our conversations in those areas of common ground, I think that would be really helpful. Go ahead. The other um, law that the gun lobby worked on here in Wisconsin this year, and they were actually successful from their point of view, was eliminating the age restrictions for hunting here in Wisconsin. And I, would ju I just want to share this with you briefly. Can you go to the next one? Why do they work so hard all around the country to eliminate hunting ages and to introduce guns to younger and younger people? And it's because they have done a number of studies that recognize and acknowledge that unless you get people interested in the shooting sports when they are very young, you will never get them as gun owners. And what they have determined is if you get someone when they are a teenager, they will stay with you and they will spend $16,000. That's what it comes down to. So this kind of uh, um, uh, quote, quote can be found just about anywhere. I just picked one. And it says, if we don't uh, improve at cultivating new hunters and shooters, the sport we love and industry we work in will eventually die away. This is a recipe for industry-wide trouble down the road. Can you go back one slide? I just wanted to mention that this is reportedly Adam Lanza, who was the shooter at Sandy Hook. You can go forward too. So what do we need to do? Um, I think the most important thing I can leave you with is that we need to make sure that the demand for gun violence prevention must be stronger and more persistent than the demand for an extremist pro-gun agenda. What we have seen in the past is that a very small minority of people are very motivated. And they do a better job of contacting their public officials, of um, expressing their opinion on social media, of signing petitions. And so I would ask that each of us um, get involved to whatever level you feel comfortable, but make sure that you are part of this.